We've been looking this weekend at the theme of grace. We began by looking at um, grace in its beginnings, and then we've looked also at grace assurance in its assurance. We've looked at uh, grace uh, in its fruits. Uh, Phil looked at that with us, and we are this morning going to look at grace in its maturation. And I want to look at that with you from Matthew 15. Matthew 15, let's read verses 21 through 28. A well-known but often misunderstood story. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Let's hear from the word of God. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet or fitting to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, I pray that this sermon would be used by thy Holy Spirit to lead thy children in this place to greater maturity of faith, to understand the magnitude of thy grace a bit better in thy preserving, maturing hand over us and to understand how thou dost work that maturation process in us and through us also to others. And I pray that those who do not know thee savingly in this audience this morning may be aroused to holy jealousy and may long for the life of thy people and may come to faith, even as they hear about the maturation of faith, and may cry out, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when couples come to me to ask me to officiate their wedding, one of the most common questions I ask them is, On a scale of 1 to 10, what kind of marriage would you like? I've never had a couple say anything below 10. One young man said, I want a 12. You see, everyone wants to have an excellent marriage, and every Christian who becomes a Christian, every person who becomes a Christian wants to be an excellent Christian. But come and visit many of those marriages 10 years down the road and ask them, on a scale of 1 to 10, what kind of a marriage do you have? And perhaps there's some 9s, some 8s, maybe quite a few 5s or 6s, even in this audience. We're all too prone to settle for a mediocre marriage. And so in spiritual life as well. As time wears on, we're prone to settle on our lees, the Bible says. Jeremiah says that God complains, my people are prone to backslide from me. And we kind of get in a rut of mediocrity. A rut that, by the way, Jesus hates. He said, I would that thou wert either cold or hot not lukewarm. I will spew you, spit you out of my mouth because you are lukewarm. And so we desperately need the grace of God 
not only to begin the Christian race, but to continue to persevere in the Christian race and to persevere by becoming more mature through all the ups and downs of life, all the afflictions of life, the joys and sorrows. And we need to understand also how the Lord Jesus Christ actually does that in our lives. And so this morning, I want to look at that theme with you from this portion that is before us. Now, you may wonder how the theme is connected with this text when you look at it because you say, I don't see anything here about mature faith. But you see, often the mysterious stories of the Gospels, the parables of the Gospels, the miracles of the Gospels, often you find their basic interpretation in the very last verse where Jesus either directly tells us what this parable means or this story means, or he hints at it in a very obvious way. And that is true of this story as well. And so we'll be walking through it, but really my, my text is verse 28, O woman, great, or as you can translate it from the Greek, O woman, mature is thy faith. And once we understand that, the conclusion, you see, then we understand what Jesus is doing in this entire process of three times over testing and trying this woman is actually to mature her faith. This is his amazing grace, his sola gratia in dealing with us to use trials to test us so that we may learn more and more and more in our lives to live by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, by the word alone. And so I want to look at this theme with you, how Christ matures our faith in three thoughts. First, by his apparent silence, verse 23. Second, by his apparent rejection, verse 24. And third, by his apparent insult, verse 26. Christ maturing our faith through silence, through uh, rejection, through insult. Now, it's an amazing thing that this woman comes to Jesus at all. An amazing thing, I say, because she was a, a woman of Canaan, a Syrophoenician, someone who had no citizenship rights, someone who was a, a, a foreigner, someone who had no religious rights, in fact, her descendants were a cursed people. It was Canaan that was cursed in the book of Genesis. But she comes. She comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. She comes to Israel not knowing where he is. And in God's amazing providence, Jesus had just left Jerusalem with his disciples where people were trying to arrest them and they managed to slip through and they get away. And Jesus takes his disciples all the way to the northern borders of Israel to Tyre and Sidon, and this woman's coming down and meets him sovereignly, graciously. It's an it's a, it's a eternally decreed sovereign grace meeting at this very place in the boundaries of Israel. This is a phenomenal thing. It's always a phenomenal thing when Jesus Christ meets a sinner where he's at and does this wonderful work of salvation. Now, this woman in particular, it appears that the Holy Spirit had already been working with her because when she came to Jesus, she didn't say, I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but she said immediately, O Lord, thou son of David, which is the Messiah title, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. So it appears she had some knowledge of him. It appears that, we don't know exactly, but... God had begun that work in her. She no doubt had had many trials with her daughter. <laughs> you can be sure she tried every doctor in the area, and no one could solve it. She, you can be sure she tried her local deity and cried out to her local God, who is no God, and he couldn't solve it. And finally, the Lord begins to work in her this need for the Messiah. She hears about Jesus. She hears some rumors about him, that he, no doubt that he... Uh, opens the ears of the deaf and heals the eyes of the blind. And she begins to think, could this, this person, this 
so-called Jewish Messiah, could he possibly also have mercy upon my daughter? And so it's all very confusing, no doubt, in her mind. But she comes to Jesus, and amazingly, she meets him on the very boundaries of Israel. It reminds you, doesn't it, of how Jesus and Zacchaeus met. Zacchaeus went up into a tree to see Jesus, and the Bible says in Luke 19 that Jesus had to stop there at that place, and Jesus looked up and saw Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus saw him. Sovereign grace, you see, arranges the meeting that brings sinners together. It's by grace we are saved, but my point this morning is it's by grace we're kept saved, and it's by grace we're matured in the way of salvation along the way. And so when this woman sees Jesus, she pours out her heart, she cries out, the streets are ringing with her noise, the Greek tense is, she repeated it over and over and over again, have mercy, mercy, mercy on me, have mercy on me, oh Lord, son of David, son of David, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not one word how strange is this the messiah she heard about in her own foreign country the messiah of whom it had been said before they call i will answer what is going on what a, what a, what a reason to doubt what an added affliction to her affliction silence is a hard answer he answered her not a word. Maybe those neighbors were right back home who must have told her, what in the world are you doing traveling all the way to Israel as a woman? You're not supposed to do that anyway. It's not kosher for a woman to travel alone like that in those days. And, and you're going to a Jewish Messiah. Don't you know that every, everyone has their local deity? He's not going to help you. He came to minister to the Jews. And now he doesn't answer a word. What an encouragement to doubt. What an added objection. But he, the one who's supposed to be merciful, the one who's supposed to heal people, were the rumors all false? He answered her, not a word. What a trial for this woman. So what's she going to do? Well, what would you do if you came to someone and they, and they didn't answer you, they didn't talk to you? You'd probably turn on your heel and say, well, if you're not even going to bother to talk to me, I don't need you either, thank you. And you, and you. and you walk your own way, and you're upset, and you go home. Or, or boys and girls, what would you do if you came home from school, or if you're homeschooled, you came home from a trip, or, or something, where you're out with somebody, and, and you ran to your mom, and you began to tell your mom about everything you experienced, and, and your mom just goes on working in the kitchen and doesn't say a word to you. And you say, Mom, Mom, don't, don't you understand? Don't you? And she doesn't say a word. You'd be upset, wouldn't you? You know something's wrong. And yet, on the other hand, we all, we all know times like this, don't we? As our faith gets matured, we all know what it means to face the silence of God. Is there anyone here who has all their prayers answered at this point? Doesn't God seem silent sometimes? Haven't you been in trials where you cried out, Lord, why aren't thou answering? The silence of God can be a tremendous burden to people, to Christians at least, to non-Christians well. Oh, if God gives me a decent wife, decent home, de decent car, de decent church, uh, I, I'm still... Many non-Christians go to church, by the way. And decent job and decent kids. And, well, for the rest, you know, God can kind of keep his distance. I don't want to get too close to God when I'm not saved. But for a Christian, the silence of God is awful. It's awful. Sean, my, my book man who's with me, we, we sat down and breakfast table this morning and, and uh, there was a woman and a man at our table as well began to talk and the woman, the woman said to us uh, 
you know, my children are getting older now, and uh, I'm beginning to realize I've got nothing to talk to my husband about after they leave the home. I'm just really afraid our marriage is going to fall apart because we're, we're, we just don't talk about anything but the children, and he's just silent. I said, you better, you better work on your marriage. You know, we offered to send her a book and so on, and we, we hope to do that. But you see, she already senses there's something wrong because there's not communication both ways. There's something wrong in a relationship when, when the other person doesn't speak back to you. And when it's God, you see, it troubles a Christian. Samuel Rutherford, a great Scottish divine, said, the bitterest ingredient the Christian has to drink in his cup of sorrow here on earth is the silence of God. David said in one of the Psalms, Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Silence of God is terrible. Remember the bride in the Song of Solomon, how she, she was lazy and she finally got up to answer the door of the bridegroom and he was gone and she began to search the streets and she began to ask people, I saw you him whom my soul loveth. I sought him but could not find him. I called him but he gave me no answer. Jeremiah, when I cry and shout, the Lord shuts out my prayer. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that my prayer should not pass through. Oh, what a burden it is. The silence of God. Because I want to be close to him. I want to speak with him. I want him to speak with me. You see, true faith can never turn around and go home, can never turn its back on Jesus Christ. The woman has nothing to go home to beside a daughter who's possessed with a demon. She's in dire need. And you see, that's the way a Christian feels. When God is silent, it's, it's almost unbearable. And then there can often be temptations with it and trials and, and, and doubts and satanic uh, delusions and Fears, David says in one of the Psalms, with anguish as from piercing sword, reproach of bitter foes I hear, while day by day with taunting word they say, where is thy God? The scoffers sneer. Silence of God. Have you ever faced the silence of God? Or are you one of those happy, clappy Christians today, wealth and health gospel Christians that says God's going to give you everything? You know, one of those Joel Olstein types. Whatever you ask for, God's going to give you right away. You go in a parking lot, you ask for an open spot, and God will open up the parking lot for you. You want a car, you ask for it, God will give it to you. That's a real deep form of Christianity, isn't it? If that's true, I've got I've to cut out of my Bible. I've got to cut out of my Psalms, probably three-quarters of them, and throw them away. Because, you see... God works through trials, and one of the trials is silence. Isn't that what the Psalms come back to again and again? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Martin Luther once left his wife on a, on a given morning to go, to go to work when he was trying to rebuild the church and having all kinds of problems. And he said to his wife as he walked out the door, My dear Katie, I think God is dead. He's so silent. And that night when he came home, all the shades, shades in his house were pulled, which, which meant someone died. And he, he, he pushed open the door and he, he said, Katie, who died today? And she said, Well, you said this morning, God. And God used that to prick his conscience and he came around. But that still doesn't answer the question, does it? Why, why would God be silent to his own people? Well, I can't possibly tell you all the reasons why, of course, because God is God and God knows all the reasons why. We don't always understand them. In fact, we seldom understand very many of them. His ways are above our ways. He says in John 13, 7, what I'm doing now you don't know, but you'll know later. You see, our lives are about like 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzles in the mind of God. God knows every piece. He's determined every piece, how they all interlock together. He knows the whole picture. We, well, we men, we can only work with one piece at a time. You know, we're very fixated. You women may be able to work with two or three or four pieces. You've got some extra sixth sense about you. But you only can work with a few pieces as well. You don't know all the reasons why. 
There's so much we don't know about why God does what he does. But that's what faith is all about, learning to trust him in the dark, learning to walk by faith and not by sight. You see, faith learns to surrender everything into God's hands. And so though I can't tell you many of the reasons, that's actually a good thing. Because it lets God be God. Martin Luther, speaking of him, he said at one point, letting God be God is more than half of all true religion. Isn't that true in the experience of your own soul? Well, I can't tell you many of the pieces, but I can tell you two of the pieces, two of the big pieces of this puzzle. And for one of them, I want you to turn with me, if you have a Bible in front of you, to John 11. John 11. There we read that Jesus loves Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and he's told that Lazarus is sick. In fact, we read in verse 6 that when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And I don't know if you've ever read this verse carefully, and you think, what? He's six miles away. He hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick unto death. He's dying. And Jesus stays where he is for two days, silent. When he finally does come, Lazarus is already dead. And both Martha and Mary, not just Martha, the busy one, but also Mary, the pondering one, come to him separately and say, Lord, they both complain, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So why in the world would Jesus wait two days and be silent? Well, verse 4 tells us explicitly. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. In other words, does Jesus Christ get more glory by healing a sick Lazarus or by raising a dead Lazarus? and translate it into your trials and your silences today. Does Jesus get more glory when he answers all your prayers right away, or does he get more glory from waiting many times to answer them until you've even almost abandoned asking, and then from the ashes of your forlorn hopes and cries, he suddenly and gloriously answers by doing more than you could expect or think so that you give him all the glory. You see, the glory of God is the first and primary reason for everything, and it's certainly the first and primary reason, therefore, for the silences of God in our lives. But the second reason is the theme of this sermon, which is to mature our faith, to purify us, to exercise us, to grow us up. You know, when you've got a baby that's one month old at home and that baby cries, what do you do, Mom? You're right there, aren't you? You meet the need of the baby. Every time the baby cries, you're there. And that child's three years old. You don't jump at every little whimper, do you? When that child cries because you're going to the store, you don't say, oh, well, I can't go to the store because I don't want you to cry. No, you say, this kid's got to grow up. He's got to learn to walk by faith. He's got to learn to believe that I'm coming back from the store. And if he's seven years old and he still cries when you leave for the store, you take him to the doctor to find out what's wrong with him. You see, it's part of growing up that you learn to walk by faith. At the beginning of the way, when grace enters our lives, God is giving us, no doubt, all kinds of little tokens of his presence, and we live off of those things. And later on, God says, I'm going to remove these stilts from you, or these crutches from you, and I want you to walk by naked faith on me, even when you can't see me, as Peter puts it. Whom having not seen, we love. Boys and girls, I want to tell you a story. When I was nine years old, my dad took me from the state of Michigan. I, I, I'll never forget, it was very special, because all alone, my dad, from the state of Michigan all the way to Hoboken, New Jersey, about 750 miles, to pick up my grandfather who was coming across the boat, on a boat from Europe across the ocean. And um, when we got into Pennsylvania, all of a sudden as we got into the Appalachian Mountains, we went into this long tunnel. I'd never been in such a long tunnel, and 
I got scared in that tunnel. I said to my dad, isn't this tunnel ever going to end? It just seemed to keep on going. My dad said, oh yeah, it'll end. Don't worry. And uh, when, it, when, when it comes to an end, you're, you're going to see just before the end a little, little speck of light at the end of the tunnel. And the, the, the light is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, you're going to break out in the sunshine. You're going to, you're going to enjoy the sunshine more than ever before. And that's exactly what happened. And 15 minutes later, we were in another tunnel. And then another one. And about, I don't know, nine of them or so. And later on, I thought, you know, that's what the Christian life is like, you see. God brings us into tunnels of darkness where he seems to be silent. He seems to be pushing us away with one hand. But unknown to us, you see, he's secretly drawing us with the other hand so that as we cry out and get no answer... Our faith is being matured even in the process. And then when we do break out and he does give an answer and we break back out into the sunshine of his grace again, somehow our faith is more mature than when we entered the tunnel in the first place. And so our lives are often checkered like that, aren't they? The Puritan John Bunyan said, When one trial doth me leave, another trial doth me seize. We go from trial to trial, tunnel to tunnel, sunshine to sunshine. And throughout the process, God matures our faith. That's what's happening here. You see, it doesn't say he didn't hear a word. It doesn't say he, 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 he was not moved by her petition. It just says he didn't answer at this moment a word. For his own glory and to mature her faith. But now we read that not only is this woman tested for the maturation of her faith by the silence of Jesus, but also by the apparent rejection of Jesus and the apparent rejection of his disciples. Look at the end of verse 23. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying after us. And he answered, and said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Talk about double-barreled rejection. The disciples and Jesus finally speak, and they both seem to reject her. So here she is, surrounded by 13 men, and 12 of them are saying, Jesus, get rid of her. We just came from Jerusalem, where there was a tumult, and we almost got arrested and thrown in jail. Now we, we travel all the way to the northern border of Israel, and this woman is filling the streets with her cries. We're going to get arrested after all. And so just, just get rid of her. She's crying after us. And you say, well, how do you explain that? How do you explain such a callous attitude on the part of these uh, disciples? Well, I just can explain that to you by saying they're sinners like all of us, and they're making three big mistakes here. Number one, they're being very selfish because they cared more about their own safety than they did about this woman's daughter who was demon-possessed. They're being indifferent. They don't seem to care about her at all, actually. And worst of all, they're being proud. They said she's crying after us when she wasn't crying after them. She was crying after Jesus. But, you know, we look at the disciples and we say, these are mere men, and we can, we can understand this. There's a problem here, but at least we can, we can understand it, knowing our own human infirmities. But what's more difficult to understand is Jesus' words, Jesus, the Savior, saying, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What in the world does that mean? Well, John Calvin explains it this way. He says, we need to distinguish here between Christ's prophetical work in his own personal ministry during his sojourn on earth, which was almost exclusively reserved for the Jews and was confined to Israel. Distinguish that from his priestly work as promised seed and Savior in whom all nations would be blessed. And since she came to him, calling out on him as the Messiah, the son of David, the Jewish Messiah, you see, Calvin says, it is as if Jesus is warning her she is acting out of turn by trying to raid the table in the middle of the meal. And what Calvin means by that is Jesus is in the midst of his own earthly ministry. He's ministering to Jews, 
One day he would die, he'd be raised again, he'd go back to his father and send his Holy Spirit, and the middle wall of partition would be broken down between Jews and Gentiles, and then the gospel would go out to, to people like this woman, this, this woman, but it's too early now. You see, he's, he's a Jewish Messiah right now. I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She was lost, but she wasn't one of the sheep, she wasn't of the house of Israel. So he seems to be rejecting her from this perspective. So now what, do, now what should she do? Well, after a second trial, you, you think uh, she should just go home. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you just give up? <laughs> Finally, he speaks, and he says, it's, basically he says, it's not for you, woman. And uh, the 12 disciples agree. It's 13 to 0 here. Um, or 13 to 1, if you count her on, on the other side. So it, it's hopeless. Just, just go home. But remember, boys and girls, faith, faith never turns its back on Jesus. Faith never goes home. What do you read? You read something just absolutely amazing. Then, verse 25, notice that, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. That is such an incredibly beautiful verse. Then, then when she's rejected, then when all the odds are stacked against her, then she came. You see, what faith does is faith falls at the feet of Jesus. Faith falls upon mercy, whether you come for the first time as a lost sinner or whether you come for the thousandth time as one who sinned again, you come again and you fall upon mercy and you say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, help me or I perish. What a glorious thing this is. She falls at his feet, even though she's rejected. And she worships him. You know, worship is a beautiful word. Actually, in the Greek, it's two words, pros and kineo. And pros means towards, and kineo means to kiss. And what it means then, literally, is when you worship God, all the affections of your entire internal being, your mind, your will, your conscience, your soul, whatever else you want to bring into that picture, everything is like a mighty torrent of affection that goes out to Christ. And you worship Him. You kiss toward Him. You bow into Him. You put, you put everything in one basket. You trust Him alone. You say... Give me Jesus, else I perish. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Now it's fascinating, don't you think, to compare her second prayer to her first prayer. Her first prayer, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Second prayer, Lord, help me. Wow. What's going on here? Well, you notice in the second prayer, her daughter is not there. It's just, Lord, help me. Why is that? Well, you see it often in the gospel, don't you? When, when, when a father or mother brings a child, that the Lord first deals with the parent. Remember the father of the demoniac boy in Mark 9? <laughs> He came, and the disciples tried to cast out the demon, and they couldn't. And finally, Jesus comes on the scene. The father gets all excited. He says, Lord, if thou canst do anything, heal this child. And Jesus turns to him and says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Suddenly, you see the spotlight is taken off of that boy foaming on the ground, and the spotlight's turned right on the heart of that father. And he cries out with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Did you ever think of it this way? If you have children, that one reason, among many, but one important reason God gave you children is to make you better worshipers of Jesus Christ. How many parents here this morning are absolutely perfect parents? You never have any needs. Your kids are always perfect. You always know what to do. No one. You see, God gives us children for many reasons, but one reason is to keep us needy so that we might be worshipers, that we might come and 
have dealings in our own soul with God through our relationship with our children. And I'm speaking in a strong way to mothers here. It's going to be Mother's Day, I think, next, next Sabbath. And uh, this is a good prep for you mothers as you're thinking about that day. Isn't it true, isn't it true that in all the ups and downs of mothering, actually your motherhood and the exercises of child rearing and your fears and your joys and your hopes and your worries have all worked together to make you more prayerful, to make you more worshipful, to actually mature your faith. so that you too learn the simple, profound prayer, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me to rear these, rear these children, not only, but help me. And you see, the beauty of this prayer is that really everything is here. I, I, it, it's a beautiful thing. You see, it's like, think of it as a, a three-link chain, like a woman's necklace, boys and girls. The word Lord reaches up all the way to heaven. He's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. The word me reaches down into the hellishness of all my own sin and my need, which is tremendous. And the word help is the mediating link where the top part of that link interlocks with the word Lord and the bottom part of the link interlocks with the word me. It's a word of mediation. It's a go-between word, help. And of course, theologically, we say that word help really belongs to who Jesus is. He, he, is actually, he actually is help with a capital H because he's both God and man. He's the mediator between us, and he's the one that can bring God and man together. The psalmist said it so beautifully, Thou hast laid help upon one who is mighty. I love, what, I love what John Bunyan does with that text, by the way, in Pilgrim's Progress. You remember, boys and girls, when you read that, how, how that uh, Christian goes into the slough of despond. He's depressed. He's, he's burdened with his sins, and, and he can't get out. He's struggling, and a man comes along and pulls him out. You remember that man's name? It's help. Help. And then Bunyan says in the margin, help is Jesus. So this woman really has everything she needs in this prayer. Three words, you see. We don't have to have long prayers to get the ear of God. We just have to have sincere prayers. Lord, help me. Have you ever prayed that with your whole heart? Boys and girls, here's a prayer for three-year-olds, and here's a prayer for 93-year-olds. No one is beyond it. It's so simple. It's so beautiful. And yet it's so important that we learn to throw our need upon Jesus Christ and learn to need his help. Well, now you say, now for sure, with this response, this woman passing this second test in a powerful way, uh, Jesus is going to answer her now. No, nope. one more test, one more test, one more but, you see. But he answered, in other word, 23, but he answered and said, verse 24, and now 26, but he answered and said, it is not fitting to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Dogs? What's going on here? Well, he seems now to be insulting her. It goes from bad to worse. First there's silence, then there's rejection. Now there's insult. You see, the Jews called the Gentiles dogs. It was a term of reproach. Jesus says it's not fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Why would, he, why would he do that? It's like calling someone a pig today. Don't ever do that, boys and girls. It's a terrible thing to do. But why would Jesus do it? Well, Jesus has another purpose in mind. He's, he's really putting this woman through a third test, you see. She, she acknowledged she was a, uh, an outsider, no doubt, and she readily would acknowledge she had no natural rights. She was a Syrophoenician, no religious rights. She's a Gentile, no citizenship rights. She's a Canaanite. But she still hadn't confessed in his presence that she's an unclean, vile outsider. And you see, dogs were unclean animals in those days. Uh, in Old Testament times, you need to know this, no one had a pet dog in Old Testament times. They were all wild, and they were considered unclean. New Testament times, people were beginning to bring just little dogs into their home as pets, and domesticating them. And there was a special word for that in Greek with a little 
uh, suffix ending on it that meant little dog. That's why the New King James Version, for example, translates this little dogs. It is not fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to little dogs because Jesus uses that Greek word here, meaning a pet dog. It's not fitting for me to take my bread for the Jews, my Jewish Messiah, and we're all sitting around the table as Jews, and I'm feeding them and teaching them to cast it to dogs. So what is this woman going to do now? Is she going to say like, Abner, am I a dog's head and get angry and go home? Is she going to say like, Joseph's brothers, we are true men. We don't deserve this kind of treatment and go home? No, 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 boys and girls. Faith never goes home. She says, truth, Lord. <laughs> Lord, I'm a dog. I'm a sinner. I'm vile. I'm needy. Truth, Lord. Yet, yet, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You know what Martin Luther said about these words? It's so beautiful. He said, she ensnared Christ in his own words. And then he added, he who loves to be so ensnared by sinners. Because you see, Jesus left her a little opening by, by that little word, little dogs. And she grabs hold of his words. She says, Lord, you call me a little dog? I'm glad to be your little dog. Because you can give all your bread to the children and just give me the leftover crumbs. I'll be happy with one crumb from you because you're king of kings and lord of lords. And anything from you is great. You know, when you get a gift from somebody, more important than what the person gives you is, is who's giving it to you. Isn't that true? When my children were very little, if they gave me a gift, I mean, some of the gifts were just made with their own little crayons, and I mean, I couldn't even tell what the picture was. I mean, in terms of value, it was zilch. You know, file it away in file 13. But no, no, they're my children. It was important. I kept all those pictures. I probably made a file of all the pictures and kept them in my study. Nobody else would think they're worth a thing. But it came from my children. And you see, a Christian says, if it comes from my God, it's worth more than everything in this world. If it's only from him, if it's stamped with his favor, Lord, give me crumbs and I'll be satisfied. I'm a spiritual beggar here. Truth, Lord, yet. You see, this woman knows how to argue with the Lord with holy argumentation, as, as Job said it. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. I would fill my mouth with holy arguments and plead my case before him. And when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's what's happening here. She's coming forth as gold. You see, this is the way to come to God in all your need. Truth, Lord, I'm naked. In, in, uh, with, with no righteousness of my own, but clothe me in the right robe righteousness of Jesus. Truth, Lord, I'm nothing but sin, but, but thou art the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Truth, Lord, I'm poor, but, but you are the rich one who became poor, that poor sinners may be made rich in you. Truth, Lord, I'm blind, but you have eyesight for the blind. Truth, Lord, I'm foolish, but you are wisdom itself. You see, that's the way to come to God. Show him your need, and then tell him who he is, and say, Lord, help me. Truth, Lord, yet. That's the paradigm of a true beggar's theology. Truth, Lord, yet. What a beautiful thing that is. And then wait on God. He will answer. He will answer in due time. But take him at his word. Bring him his promises. That's the best way to pray to God, you see. As our faith gets matured, we learn to bring God's own handwriting back to him. And we learn to say, Lord, do as you have said. You know, in my study, I've got a number of uh, prayer books behind me. Charles Spurgeon's prayers just behind my desk. I keep them close by. Benjamin Jinks' prayers and a number of other divines. And when I get a little discouraged about my own prayer life and my own coldness, I sometimes just pick off one of those books and just start reading it. And what I find is almost the entire prayer is just Scripture. It's just Scripture. Bringing back God His own Word. Clinging to promises like this woman. <laughs> Little dog, here I am, Lord. 
I'm happy to be your dog. Please give me a crumb that falls from the master's table. So what this woman does so beautifully, you see, she takes Christ at his own word. She pleads on him now in his all-sufficiency. She doesn't say son of David again, Messiah title for the Jews. She says, Lord, Lord of heaven and of earth, help me. And one crumb will do. Boys and girls, can I tell you one more story in this sermon about my dad? When my dad was nine years old, my grandparents were very, very poor, very poor. And they lived in just like a two-room house, no garage. In fact, their house was, was, was probably not as big as your double-car garage. And there was a train track going through the backyard, and the train would often stop there, and beggars would get off of the train, and they'd come to the front door. And so one day, a beggar came to the front door, and my dad, I said he was nine years old, he answered the door, and the beggar says, I need a sandwich. So my dad goes to my grandma, and he says, there's a beggar on the door, and he needs a sandwich. And my grandma says, oh, you just go tell him we're just as poor as he is. So that's what my dad did, and he went to shut the door. But the beggar stuck his foot in the door. My dad couldn't shut it. He looked up at the beggar, and the beggar looked down at him and said, I need just one slice of bread. My dad didn't know what to do, so he went back to my grandma. He said, the beggar won't go away. He needs just one slice of bread. Oh, my grandma said, he's a real beggar. Make him a whole sandwich. You see, we need to learn the art of spiritual beggary of, with God. We need to stick our foot in the door and keep on praying through silence, through what seems to be rejection or insult or whatever trial God puts upon us, and press on and press on and press on. John Bunyan once made a list of the top ten sins of his life for his own personal confession. And I forget if it was number three or four or six, somewhere in the middle there, was this. I pray, but don't continue waiting on God in prayer. You know, sort of like a salesman comes on your door. He knocks once and he walks away and you go to the door and he's halfway across the lawn to the next house and you turn around and say to your wife, oh, well, must just be a salesman. He only knocked once. I'm not going to chase that guy down. You see, God matures us as we wait on him, as, as he doesn't answer all our prayers right away, and we wait on him and we press on the door of grace as, as, as mercy in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. She kept on knocking. Christiana's let in. The kids are let in. She keeps on knocking, says Bunyan, until she would have fainted. And then the good man of the house lets her in. God is sovereign. Sometimes God answers our prayers Right away. Sometimes we're let in right away. Other times it takes longer. God is free. God has his own wise reasons. We need to trust him, you see. And this woman realizes that. This is a beautiful way to pray. Give me the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And the beautiful thing about God, you see, is when he gives you something, those crumbs are never just crumbs. She passes this third test wonderfully, and then what does Jesus say? Verse 28, he answers and says to her, O woman, great is thy faith, mature is thy faith now, be it unto you even as you will. It's like Jesus said, here's, here's the keys. Here's the keys to my storehouse of grace. You can go in and take now everything you want. You see, when we beg for crumbs, he always does exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians 3.20. And this woman goes into a storehouse. I'm speaking, of course, figuratively now. It's like she takes two full loaves of bread, and she goes home, one loaf for her daughter, one loaf for herself, and she finds her daughter made whole from that very hour. And the Greek word for wholeness actually means well-rounded wholeness. She's made whole in body. She's made whole in soul. The devil is gone. The first thing they talk about is, of course, Jesus, how wonderful he is, what a healer he is, how they praise him. Everything is made well. But all along the process, this all had to happen. The apparent silence, the apparent rejection, the apparent insult, at the same time to mature this woman's faith. You see how gracious God is? He works at several different levels in several different ways, all at the same time. So he gets all the glory, our faith gets matured, and all things work together for good to those that love him. He coordinates all of this down to every detail of our lives.
But that leaves one question. One question and one illustration, and then I'm done. What right does this woman really have to have all these blessings? After all, she was a Syrophoenician. She was a sinner. Well, did you notice that my three points when I gave them out at the beginning of this sermon are apparent silence, apparent rejection, apparent insult. Why did I use the word apparent? Well, because Jesus endured the real thing so this woman could receive his blessings. He endured the real silence. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Deafening silence. His father not pushing him away with one hand and drawing him with the other, but his father pushing him away with both hands under a closed heaven, a silent God, so that he could speak to you, sinner, as you come to him. And he's rejected. He's rejected. He's rejected by men. He's rejected by the women. He's rejected by God. He's rejected by the devils. He's rejected by everyone and everything. He has to trod the wine press alone on the cross so that you never have to be rejected in truth. And then he's insulted, spit upon, slapped, mocked, crowned with thorns, blindfolded, smitten across the face. Tell me, prophesy, who smote you? He gets on the cross, they say, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross and save yourself and us. Insulted at every step of the way. Naked. They take his only clothing, his only stitch of clothing, a robe, and they cast lots for it beneath the cross. What an insult. He endures the real thing. We endure the shadow to follow him, to be trained by him, to be matured by him. But... There's no real silence. There's no real rejection. There's no real insult. It's all apparent so that he can train and mold us and mature our faith so that in the end of the day, we want to surrender our entire lives back to him. Which leads me to my closing illustration this morning about... Uh, a rich nobleman, an English nobleman, who was going back through New Orleans in the 1850s after having made millions more through the California gold rush back to England. And he did what most tourists did at that time, went to the infamous African slave trading block. There was a beautiful young lady on the stand, and in the back of the crowd were two, two men out trying to outvie each other to purchase her, and they were whispering what they'd do to her if they got her, and it was dreadful, and the, the nobleman was incensed, and he got the auctioneer's attention and said, I'll pay twice the amount that anyone will ever pay for the price of this slave, and the auctioneer couldn't believe it. He stopped in his tracks. He said, no one's ever paid this price. You really have the money. The man reached in his pocket, waved the bills. The auctioneer said, sold, and uh, the man came up and took the young lady down from the stand, and she spit him in the face. He wiped the spit away, took her to a downtown office, argued with a man behind the desk, got some papers, signed them, handed them to the young lady, said, these are your manumission papers, and she spit him in the face again. He said, don't you understand, as he wiped it away, don't you understand, you are free. And she just stared at him, and she couldn't, she couldn't believe it. Finally, she just collapsed at his feet, and she just began to cry and cry and cry. And finally, she said... Sir, she said, do you mean to tell me you paid twice the amount anyone's ever paid for the price of a slave just to set me free? And he said, yes. And she began to cry some more. And finally, she looked up at him and she said, sir, I have just one favor to ask of you. Can I serve you forever? You know, that's the way a Christian feels. Paul said, I'm a willing servant. In the Greek, it's actually a willing slave. Not the kind of cruel slavery, but wonderful servanthood to serve God forever. You see, that's the way this woman feels after Jesus fills her with these two loaves of bread. She just wants to respond to him. She's full of gratitude. She finds her daughter whole. You can imagine, she just wants to go out and serve him completely. That's what mature faith does. When Christ matures our faith through trials, we just fall so in love with him. We say, Lord, you've made no mistakes in my life. You've done everything well. What can I do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I want to be your servant forever. That's what grace does. 
Is Jesus Christ maturing your faith through trial? And are you responding and saying, make me your willing servant forever? Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we thank thee so much for thy superabounding grace, not only in bringing us to faith, not only in giving us assurance of faith, not only in producing the works of faith, as we heard from Titus, but also in maturing our faith graciously. It's all grace, Lord, all along the way. So we thank Thee so much for being patient with us and maturing us step by step, also through life's trials. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.